And so, yes, I did write a book, Killing Christians, Living the Faith, where it's not safe to believe because we work in the Middle East and with the E3 partners, and E3 is we equip believers to evangelize their nation and establish new churches, and also a ministry with us is I Am Second, and so that's what we do, and we're out there, and man, I'm so jazzed that I get to work in the Middle East because there's so much that's happening that you're just not going to believe because you're not going to see it on the news. I mean, it's really sad, but unfortunately, a lot of times we take our worldview from the news, and we don't know what's happening out there. So I pray that you'll be filled up. I'll pray that the God will just pour into you these next few days, and that you will just go away off the ground, ready to serve Jesus in these important days. So what's happening in the Middle East? Well, there's a lot of persecution, but do you know globally now, there are 43,000 denominations, 43,000. I mean, that's just shocking to me. I mean, Jesus said, we're one, but we're 43,000 at this point. And, and, and that's a lot of disagreements in the body of Christ. But when the Egyptians walked on the beach in Libya and ISIS was going to kill them, everybody stood up and said, wait a minute, brothers in Christ, we need to pray for them. We need to get involved in this. So if you're like me, you're kind of getting tired of the news and all the negativity, and Islam is in 58 wars. Uh, the other night I turned on TV, and the first seven stories were on Islamic terrorism. It was interesting, they didn't use the word Islam once, but all seven of them were. And, and look at what happened starting last spring with ISIS, rise to power, and how, how they're growing. And look at them compared to Al-Qaeda. I mean, they started with $35 million. ISIS started with $1.2 billion. And uh, we're seeing Christians being killed. We're seeing this hostility in the Middle East. We're seeing threats in America. I live in Dallas, Texas. Two Muslim terrorists were killed just a couple of weeks ago. But I just want to remind you guys of this. By the way, Jesus is still on the throne. Amen. Did you know that? As Corey Tin Boom used to say, there's no panic in heaven. There's no panic mode. The body of Christ is winning. The fastest growing church per capita in the world right now is in the heart of Islam, in the Middle East, right in the midst of ISIS. But we're going to get to that. So let's go to the bad news first, then we'll get to the good news, okay? Let's cue it up if we can. Let's go to our next one if we can. Okay, so this is Hamas. This is their charter. This is what they're founded under. Israel is supposed to negotiate. I don't think it's going to work. Okay, next one if you would. Uh, when, when the three yeshiva boys were kidnapped last summer and we were there and Israel went into national mourning, there was celebration in Gaza. Uh, they see this as something they did for God. Okay, next one. These are some of the rockets that can reach all of Israel. There was a time out of Gaza where they could only shoot maybe 50, 60 miles. Now they can virtually hit every point uh, in Israel. Okay, next one if you would. Boy, have you seen that in the media? Does Israel just get blamed for everything? I mean, it's unbelievable. Okay, next one. Uh, this is Sederot. These are recent rockets in Sederot. It's about a half mile from Gaza. And uh, a lot of Holocaust survivors live there, Jewish Holocaust survivors. Now they live close to Hamas. They want to kill them too. Okay, next one. Under Hamas rule, no one is safe in Israel. In fact, that's one thing that Palestinians and the Israelis can agree on. They would love a Hamas-free Gaza. Okay, next one. Israeli Defense Forces. Did you know there are Arabs serving in the IDF, the Israeli Defense Force? I've never seen that on the news for some reason, Okay. Next one, if you would. Is there an answer? This is Mohammed of Gaza. He grew up in Gaza, loves the Lord Jesus. When Jesus changed his heart, he fell in love with Jewish people. And so you know what Mohammed does? He shares the gospel with Orthodox rabbis. They can't believe it. One of them he was sharing with on the street, and he said, you know, when I came to Jesus, he's Jewish, by the way, I just fell in love with Jewish people. And, and so this rabbi called him back and said, you know, it's Sabbath, it's Shabbat dinner, and I'm telling my family that you're Palestinian and you love us as Jewish people. They're not believing me. Can you come to our house for dinner? He said, I'll be right over. Okay, next one, if you would. These are the 
uh, announcements that the IDF dropped in Gaza when the rockets, when they were shooting rockets in to get Hamas to be humane, to get people out of the buildings. Unfortunately, Hamas came over the loudspeakers of the mosque and said anybody that leaves these buildings will be shot on sight. They were shooting their own people. Next one, if you would. So what's happening in the Middle East? Well, this was the empire for 400 years. There weren't countries. There was just an empire. And the Ottoman Turks ruled for 400 years. Next one, if you would. And then in, during the World War I, the Turks lost. It was the breakup of the empire. It's coming here. And all of a sudden, national countries came into being. You had the British, the French. It was called the Mandate Period. And uh, nations were carved up. And that's how the identities came about. Winston Churchill said this, on a Sunday afternoon, with a map, a pen, and a cup of tea, I created three nations. And so that's how it is today. Next one, if you would. And then Iran arrived on the scene. Uh, really the epicenter of terrorism, the Ayatollah that started in 79. He died, this is Ayatollah Khomeini today. It's home base for Shia Islam. Okay, next one, if you would. And then, of course, ISIS. And you saw Bakar al-Baghdadi, uh, al who made his famous speech in Mosul and said he was the next leader of Islam. Uh, next picture, if you would. Sunni Muslim. This is his cabinet. This is like a who's who of terrorism throughout the Middle East. These are the guys that are under Baghdadi. Sunni Muslims. Next one, if you would. The three Iraqs. For all the work, for all the hard work, there are many people are predicting we may have Three Iraqs, when it's all said and done, will have the Sunni side. You can see in the light color. And the green is the Shiite side. The striped area is what's up for grabs. And then the Kurds are in the north. Uh, and so it's essentially a Sunni-Shiite split. Next one, if you would. And so it may end up like this, erasing all the national borders and a Sunni state and a Shia state that will flow into Iran. The battle right now is for Baghdad, and of course they pledge the next city they'll battle for would be what? Jerusalem, absolutely, you bet. Okay, next one if you would. So the Mosul uh, uh, believers had to spray paint the Arabic noon on their uh, front of their house to represent of the Nazarene, and of course they were all thrown out. Next one, please. They were forced to convert or die. These are all the above ground churches in Mosul. Uh, the church goes back to like the first century. They were destroyed. Next one, if you would. And all the people were run out, convert to Islam. There's ISIS on the top, pay an exorbitant tax. They never could have paid, die or leave. And they left 200,000 of them left. Next one, if you would. Okay. So is this woman a Muslim or a follower of Jesus? Well, it's hard to tell because so many are coming to faith in Christ. We know many women that wear the hijab that have left Islam that privately love Jesus. We do medical clinics. If any of you guys want to go to the Middle East and make a difference, any of you have doctors and nurses, come and do a medical clinic. This was one in uh, Gaza that we did, and this woman came, and uh, it was amazing to hear her story, but we do uh, eyeglass clinics, right? So they don't have like reading glasses. So we give eyeglasses. They come into the eyeglass clinic. We give them an Arabic Bible, have them read John 3.16, and then try, okay, how do those glasses work? How about these? <laughs> Better or worse? We make sure they read it seven times. And so this woman actually uh, talked to one of the doctors, and we said, be careful with the gospel. Don't lead with it. We don't want the mom to throw us out. But this woman came and met the first doctor, had a shoulder problem, wanted to see the doctor, and he takes her in behind a curtain. She's there with her husband. He says, I'll look at your sh uh, shoulder. And she said, first patient of the clinic, she says, Dr. Jeff, are you a Christian? He says, well, yes, I am. She pulls up her black sleeve, pulls up her under black sleeve, and has a tattoo of a cross on her forearm. She said, I love Jesus. He's shocked. I mean, he said, what about her husband? Looks over at her husband. He says, me too. <laughs> we found out they're, they're part of an underground church, 12 couples. Okay, next one. Syrian refugee women studying the Bible that have come into Jordan. 25 of them met Jesus on this day. Next one, if you would. This is our Syrian team, and we'll talk about them in a minute. Next one, you would. Exodus of Muslims from the religion of Islam. 
Let me tell you, you're never going to see this on the news, but there's an implosion happening throughout the Middle East. Next one, if you would. This is Daniel, or E3, Iraq leader. He used to drive a tank for Saddam Hussein. Boy, is he on fire for Christ when he, when he became a believer. Next one. Ah, okay, if you could do this. How many of you have a phone with you? Do you have a phone? Let me see. Would you do me a favor? If you could just pull that out. Let me explain this. E3 Partners, it's the most the most aggressive initiative we've ever entered into. There's a couple of thousand unengaged, unreached people groups left on planet Earth. That means no Bibles, no churches, no missionaries. This year, we are going after 14 of them throughout the Middle East. Let me tell you, Satan wants to keep them away from the gospel. There's been serious blowback as we're working in these areas. We need your help. Could you take a picture of that? And remind yourself to pray. Just keep it on your phone. Those are the 14 unengaged groups throughout Asia. Most of those groups are Muslim. But that would just help us more than you can imagine, knowing that pastors are praying. And we're already seeing some things happening, but Satan is really blocking us. 14 unengaged. No churches, no missionaries, no Bibles, no gospel whatsoever. But this year we're going after 14 because we believe They need to know who Jesus is. And they've been kept off to the side for years, but God's going to break through. Okay, next slide. I think I got two more. This is next one, if you would. Did everybody get a picture? Okay. It's not that clear. I don't know. You might have to walk up. I don't know. Or maybe I can send send you a slide later if you want to do this. I'm Tom Doyle, 80 at Gmail, Tom, D-O-Y-L-E. Tom Doyle 80 at gmail.com. Love to send it to you, okay? Thank you. 838. Here's another thing you could do to help, okay? Believers in the Middle East are persecuted. So we set our watches and our iPhones at 838 p.m. every night. And when it goes off, we stop what we're doing and pray for believers that are in prison, persecution, and danger. And let me tell you, if they come out of Islam... That's a majority of them. So we pray for those that are in prison, persecution, and danger. That's our Facebook page. If you like it, you'll get updates every day on the scenes from Syria, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, believers saying, would you pray about this? You could share it with your churches. In some cases, you can even go back and forth and dialogue with them, okay? I think that that's it anymore. So, okay. Killing Christians. We already talked about that. All righty. So I'm a pastor for 20 years. I'm doing Bible tours to Israel, fall in love with the Jews. I'm pro-Israel. I love it. In 2001, God called us to leave the pastorate to go and be a missionary in the Middle East. I mean, I was shocked. I was a lifer as a pastor. I was never going to do anything else. God called us to leave. So he made the announcement to our church, and it's a large church in the Colorado Springs area, and People were upset, and I had people tell me, you can't go, and then 9-11 happens, and people saying, you're American, you're Christian, it's going to be terrible, you shouldn't go to the Middle East. I mean, one guy said this, he said, Tom, you have six children, you're just stupid for going to the Middle East, go somewhere else, go to South America, you're just stupid. And that, of course, was my father that said that, (laughs) but but anyway... um, So we went, not knowing what to expect, and here we go into Gaza Strip. The very first day we go into Gaza Strip, it's a couple of months after 9-11. Voice of the Martyr said it's one of the most dangerous places in the world, if not the most dangerous. Go into Gaza City. Day one, I'm there. A Muslim woman walks up to me in a hijab and grabs my forearm. Now, if you've been to the Middle East, you know this. They don't talk to men, Muslim women, much less grab their forearm, this woman grabs my forearm and says, hey, you're an American, aren't you? And I said, well, yeah. And she said, I could tell by your eyes. Okay, all right. And she said, hey, did you see, spoke perfect English, when the buildings came down on September 11th, and they showed it all over the world, and then they showed in Gaza, and people were cheering and celebrating. Did you see that? And I said, well, yes, I did. And she said, well, not me. I was crying for those people because they didn't deserve to die. And that was wrong. And I'm very sorry for you and America. And she turned on her heel and walked away. 
And I thought, Lord Jesus, there's human beings in the Gaza Strip. I mean, I thought they were all cold-blooded terrorists. But you know what? The gospel is moving through that region. So take your Bible, open to 1 Thessalonians 1. We're going to look at about five or six verses. Thessalonian church sure reminds me of the present day church in the Middle East. Let's pick it up in verses 4 and 5. 1 Thessalonians 1. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you, because our gospel came to you, not only in word, but also in, in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we prove to be for your sake. And so here we go. The gospel just burst onto the scene in Thessalonica. You know the situation. Acts 17, Paul and Silas there, three Sabbaths. There's all kinds of things that happen, but it ends up that the church is born right in the midst of persecution. Right off the bat, the church is persecuted. But look at what the Lord says, loved by God, chosen. He uses this endearing language. He wants them to know that they're not forgotten, but the word came in power and the Holy Spirit. And I can just tell you it's the same way today. The gospel never comes into a person, a people group, or a culture quietly. It makes a grand entrance. And so my friend Hisham lives in Iraq, and he was best friends with Michael. Michael was, became a believer, and he started to share the gospel with everything that moved. And, and everyone, Hisham is his best friend, he's a Muslim. And so for two years, he is sharing the gospel with Hisham, a Muslim in Iraq. They're forced to be in Saddam Hussein's army. Michael doesn't want to be there, but they kill you if you if you don't stay. So he has to be in the army, but he's sharing Jesus' love with Hisham. For two years, he's telling him about Jesus. Finally, Hisham says, that's it. I've had it for two years. Michael, every conversation ends up being about Jesus. I talk about the weather, and it goes to Jesus. Would you just knock it off and give me a New Testament? I'll read it because I want to show you the mistakes because I'm a Muslim. And of course, we know the Bible has been corrupted. So let me just read it. I'll get back to you, show you the mistakes. Then you can convert to Islam, not vice versa. Got it? He says, okay, here's the, here's the New Testament. Gives him an Arabic New Testament. About three and a half weeks later, Hisham calls Michael and says, hello, Michael. Yes, this is Hisham. Yes, yes. I have a big problem. What's the problem? He said, I read the New Testament. Well, that's good. He said, no, no, here's the bad thing. I think I'm falling in love with Jesus. <laughs> he said, well, 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 that's a good thing. No, but I'm a Muslim. I mean, this would get me in trouble. And, but the way he treated the woman at the well, the man born blind, the paralytic, Jesus went out of his way to reach out to those that had nothing. But you know what? I, here's what I'll do. I'll read the Old Testament because, you know, those Jews are very clever, and I know they change things. So I'm going to find the mistakes there and then come back to you. Jesus, he's okay, but I'm going to read the Old Testament and prove you wrong. He says, give me two months. Okay. So he comes back. About like five weeks later, he's just reading the Old Testament. Hello, Michael. Yes, this is Hisham. Yes, how you doing? I have a big problem. What's the problem this time? He said, the Jews could not have written the book on their own. The Jews did not write the Old Testament on their own. Oh, why are you saying that? He goes, if the Jews wrote it on their own by themselves, they would have made themselves look a whole lot better. That's pretty good wisdom. And he said, not only that, but I can see the promises. I looked them up. Isaiah. 700 years before Jesus. They could only be fulfilled in Jesus. So I got to pray. I'm going to take a month. I'm going to pray and I'm going to fast because this has brought me to a crisis in my faith. So think about this. He's heard the gospel for two years. He's heard, read the New Testament. Now he's read the Old Testament. Now he is going to pray and fast before he decides I'm going to follow Jesus. Would, would we get an amen for those kind of church members? <laughs> amen. So he starts praying. And on day 26, 
He has a glorious vision of Jesus who says, Hisham, I love you. Come to me. I died for you. And he called Michael and said, Michael, I don't have any problems anymore. (laughs) Hisham today serves Jesus in Iraq. So if you don't mind, write his name down. He's a pastor, Hisham, H-I-S-H-A-M. He just got shot in the head about three weeks ago. He survived. He went to the hospital, survived. He's out there bringing the gospel throughout Iraq. Well, it was crazy. We started working in the Middle East, and we started running into Muslims that were having dreams about Jesus. In fact, I wrote a book, Dreams and Visions. Just started writing notes on all these stories. I couldn't believe all of these people having dreams about Jesus. So there's a there's a man in Damascus. His name's Abdul. He lives next to a guy named Daniel. And Abdul is a Muslim. Daniel's a believer. And uh, Daniel's trying to just love him to Jesus. And Abdul always asks him to come over and pray. Pray with me. Well, pray with my family, please. I just love when you Christians pray and you trust Jesus. And so he's praying and praying. Well, it ends up that Abdul gets really sick and goes to the hospital. He's an elderly gentleman. He goes to the hospital, and uh, he calls uh, Daniel, and Daniel comes to pray for him. It's not looking good, and he gets worse. He wasn't counting on that, so then he starts calling pastors throughout Syria. Hey, pray for Abdul. In Damascus, he's sick. He wants to know about Jesus, but I'm afraid he's going to die. He's got a kidney disease. He's hooked up to machines. It's not looking good. And so finally, it gets worse and worse, but believers are praying. And the family leaves to go home for just a few hours to plan his funeral because he's going. And the next morning, a nurse walks in, and there's Abdul, and he's sitting up in bed. He's got all the tubes and everything, and they look at him. He should have died last night. What happened? And they start to do tests, and he's stable, and they start to pull different things out, and finally, they pull the trach out, but what happened, Abdul? You, last night, it looked like you were going, and he said, oh, Jesus came to my room last night. Jesus came to your room? Yeah, Jesus came to my room, and he said that he loved me, and he was going to touch me and heal me for his glory. So what do the nurses do when they can't explain things? They go get the doctors, right? So the doctors come back, and, and all of them committed Muslims. Abdul, what, what happened? Oh, Jesus came to my room last night. It couldn't have been Jesus. It was a, a nice imam. It was a sheikh. No, 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 no. No, it was Jesus. And one of the Muslim doctors said, well, you know what, Abdul? <laughs> That's the New Testament. Jesus doesn't come to Syria anymore. He said, well, he did last night because he was in my room. And the man pressed him further. It couldn't have been Jesus. It was a good imam. It was a good sheikh that came and prayed for you. That's what it was. Admit it. Tell the truth. No, no, I know it was Jesus. Well, how can you be so sure? And he said, well, that's simple. I've never met an imam or a sheikh that had nail prints in his hands and in his feet. It was Jesus. And later on, Abdul comes to faith in Christ. He has a house church today in Damascus. So when you think of Damascus and you see all the bombing runs, pray for Abdul. He's leading people to faith in Jesus. God is moving among them. So my sons, Josh and Tommy, were on the border of Syria and Turkey, and they're reaching out to Sunni Muslims that are Syrian refugees that have left the country, and they're in Turkey, And so they bring them food, and they're playing with the kids. They got a team, and it's just, it's going great, but they really want to share Jesus. And so they've been there a couple of hours, and finally, Josh said, I just realized, okay, it's time to get into the gospel here. And he said, Dad, I don't know what happened, but my mind went blank. I mean, I couldn't think of a Bible verse. I couldn't think of my own testimony. And I'm, Lord, give me a word to say to these Muslims. They're desperate. They like us. And he said, it just, I blurted out of my mouth. Hey, if any of you Muslims had a dream about Jesus? And then he thought, well, that was a stupid thing to say. They're not going to admit that in front of other Muslims. They'd be afraid to. And a woman steps out of the crowd and says, I did. I had a dream about Jesus in Syria. 
And he told me that he loved me and he loved my family. And if I would follow him, I would be safe. And so he got us out of Syria and said that one day we'd go back. But I'm a Muslim. Why does, why does this Jesus love me so much? Can you tell me why? Well, Josh is a missionary, right? He's on our staff at E3. It doesn't get any easier than that for openers. Are you tracking with me? I mean, if he blows that one... He ought to be fired, right? And I got to do it. And he shares Jesus with about 30 Sunni Muslims, and they're listening to the stories. And over time, about 20 come to faith in Christ, open, ready, willing to reach out to Jesus. Listen, more Muslims, and you're never going to see this on the news, more Muslims have come to faith in Christ in the last 10 to 15 years than in the last 14 centuries of Islam. So just let that settle in. In the last 10 to 15 years, more Muslims come to faith in Jesus than the last 14 centuries of Islam. And someone clapped. You know what? We can clap for that, right? Wow. And boy, do they have a tough life after that. Because they have to ask him the two questions. I mean, if you're going to leave Islam and become a Jesus follower, you got to know what you're in for, right? I mean, it's only being honest. So they ask him two questions. Number one, are you willing to be persecuted for Jesus? Because it'll probably happen. It'll probably come from your family. Number two, are you willing to die for Jesus? And so right from the beginning, it's in their DNA. And look at this in verse 6. Look at the Thessalonians in verse 6. And you became imitators of us. And of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Severe suffering, much affliction. They suffered from the beginning. Can a, a new church survive in persecution when it's birthed in persecution? Listen, you know what our history is? We thrive in persecution. They are like Twins that are conjoined together, harvest, persecution, harvest, persecution. Throughout our 20 centuries, that's the way it is. The gospel thrives in adversity. And so I'm going on my first mission trip in 2001, going to go to Gaza Strip, Jordan, UAE. That's where I met the woman that was there that grabbed my arm. And so, so there I am, and the next day we go to a mosque in the Gaza Strip, And the Israelis have just hit some area around it because Arafat was alive then shooting out rockets and they said, cut it out or we're going to blow up your house. They do, but then they leave the mosque. They don't touch a religious structure. So we're going to go to the mosque and we're going to hang out there and try to meet Muslims and give them the love of Jesus. So I'm with Hussein, former Muslim, and he said, uh, hey, Tom, just so you know, um, I mean, it could go bad here today. We, we could be arrested for our faith here. We could be arrested. And he said, but really, you know, every believer needs to go to jail at least once for their faith. <laughs> it's really good for you. You know, there's nothing to be afraid of after that. Death, you're going to be with Jesus. That's, that's good. I said, okay, got you. And he goes, and if it really goes bad, <laughs> I mean, we could be killed for our faith today. But... I'm a former Muslim. I know that. I'm ready to die for Jesus. This is my first mission trip, right? You're ready to die for Jesus, aren't you, Tom? I said, yes. Do you mean like right now is what do you you mean right now? And I'm thinking in my mind, my gosh, this is going to be the shortest missionary career ever, ever. But that's how they live. And that's what their life is about. This is Their life, this is what they're ready for because they know there's going to be persecution. So we met this woman named Akram, and she was in Darabella refugee camp in Gaza. And we were doing some food food distribution, trying to bring a little of Jesus to this radical Palestinian camp in the midst of Gaza. We met this woman, Akram. She's 20 years old, fully covered, speaks English. We're talking. I said, hey, Akram with the team, what, what, what is, and she has nine brothers and sisters, what's, what's your, 
what's your goal in life? What would you love to see happen in your lifetime? She said, oh, I want to finish college. I want to work for five years, save up, save up, save up. And one day, I want to buy a computer. I want to have a laptop computer. And I thought, oh my gosh, that's the life goal. Are you kidding? I mean, it's terrible. Lives in a tent. There's dead animals in the dirt right by the house. And so I'm back. I'm preaching at a church in Atlanta. And I told her story. Wasn't even thinking about anything. And a guy came up afterwards and said, I bought a computer last night I've been saving for. And it's top of the line Toshiba, fire-breathing monster. It's got everything. And you told that story. And God said, give it to a crom. So are you sure I wasn't trying to lead up to that. He goes, no, 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 I get it. I give it to a crom. Really? Okay. So we get it. And nine months later, we go back to Gaza. And there's no street signs in Darabella refugee camp. It's just dirt hills, animals, terrorists, enclaves, tents, lean-tos. Miraculously, in the thousands of people that live there, we find a crom's little tent. And she said, you came back. We said, yeah. Remember that dream you had? Your life goal, that dream? And she said, yeah, to have a computer some." My wife Joanne had it behind her back, and she said, well, Jesus made it happen. And she just stared. Like, it'd be like if I just came up and gave you keys to a new car. Shocking. What? And, of course, we're not stupid. We had loaded every Christian program on the computer, the Bible, the Jesus video, Mary Magdalene. Everything was loaded on it, ready to go, point and shoot, de- icons on the desktop, ready to go, be fired up by the time we get home from Israel. She's sending us messages, emails. Well, I, I, you're like spiritual parents. I love you. Why would you do this? And why would your team do this? Well, about a year later, and this is fanatical. When you think of the fanatics in Israel, it is the refugee camps in Gaza. It's the worst. We didn't know one believer there. So we came back about a year later, and I sent an email to Akram, and, and I said, um, we had music on there and all that. I said, uh, you know, I'm actually going to be at the only church there in Gaza, the only evangelical church, but I know you're Muslim, and you probably can't come, but I'm going to be there at 1030, a few hours there for the afternoon. Hopefully, we can see you, even though it's miles away. We get to the church at 10 o'clock. There's Akram sitting in the church by herself with her cousin, ready, and we start to do praise and worship, and she starts singing. Well, that's a little shocker. And then I said to her, Akram, um, you know, um, I'm going to go up and do this sermon. It's, we talk from the Bible. It's kind of like what the imam does at the mosque on Friday. Oh, only I'm not calling for the destruction of Israel. No, I didn't say that. But, <laughs> uh, but I was thinking that, right. You know, so, when, so I'm going to do this, and then, and then I'll be back and shared from the word, shared the gospel, came back, sat down, and Akram. She takes her fist and pounds me on the thigh and says, good job, Tom Doyle. And I said, you like that? She said, well, of course I do, because I have Jesus in my heart now. And as far as we know, maybe the first believer there, but let me tell you, their life is difficult, suffering, persecution, And listen, Muslims that come to faith in Christ live by four words. This describes them. If they're going to really live out their faith, here they are. Immediate, radical, costly obedience. Immediate, radical, costly obedience. Look at verses 7 and 8 in uh, chapter 1. So that you became an example of... To all believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For not only is the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we need not say anything. I believe today persecuted believers are becoming the, the genuine face of genuine believers that call themselves Christians. It, it, the gospel thrives in persecution. That's how we grow. If you leave us alone, that would be a better MO for the Muslims, really. If you leave us alone, we might just fight over theology or something or music in the church or whatever. You know, that's what happens, but it thrives. It is like a plant in a hothouse. So the Ayatollah comes into to, um, Iran in 1979, and he said this, we'll squash the church. We'll crush it. 
There'll never be two religions in Iran. Everybody will be a Muslim. So maybe 5,000 believers in Iran at that time, we're not exactly sure. We'll squash it. What happens when you try to crush the church, guys? It's like hitting your fist in water. It just sprays all over. Today, Operation World, which is the Encyclopedia of Missions textbook, says this. The fastest growing church per capita in the world is in the nation of Iran today. And the Ayatollah said, we'll squash the church. But that didn't work. In fact, you know what we like to say in missions, that the Ayatollah is really one of the great missionaries of the day. (laughs) He drove more people out of Islam and into the arms of Jesus than just about anybody. And so there's a man in Syria, and his name is Malki. And Malki had a heart for the Druze of Syria. Now, how many of you have been to Israel up on the Golan Heights? You've seen the Druze up there on the other side of the fence in Syria. You have the Druze there, but as far as we knew, not one believer in over 100 years. They were an unengaged people group. No believers, nothing happening. Nobody trying to reach them. But Malki believed that God led him to go live there, and he went. And for two years, nothing happened. Nothing. He talked to people, not interested, nothing. And so he's praying, Lord, send them dreams. They're like a Muslim split-off group. Send them dreams like the Muslims are having nothing. And so he's on his face saying, Lord, I I don't even know what to do. You're going to have to break through. Because you said in Matthew 16, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell are not going to stop it. So bust through. I I don't even know what that means, but do it, Lord. The next day there was a knock on the door and he opened the door and there's a Druze man. And he said, you know, I have a daughter and um, she has leukemia. And the doctor says, it's not good. And I know you're a Christian, and I've heard that people pray to Jesus, and sometimes he does miracles. Would you pray for my daughter? So he brings the daughter, and Malki says, I know Jesus can heal. I've heard of Jesus healing, but I have never seen it in my life. But here's an unbeliever, and he's asking for Jesus to do something. i got to pray for him. So he brings the daughter in. Lays hands on her, Lord, do something, do a miracle, send your spirit, raise her up, touch her body. And the prayer's over, and seemingly nothing happens. So the man thanks him, shakes his hand, leaves. But a week later, he goes from his little village in the Druze area into Damascus for his daughter to be rechecked, and it's her her monthly checkup there with the doctor. And they go in, and they're surprised at some of the signs they're seeing And then they start to run tests, and finally they do blood tests and keep going and going. And they came in and said to Omar, we don't know how to say this, but she doesn't have leukemia. It's not there. We know she had it, but it's it's gone. So Omar comes back to the village. Didn't say a word to Malki, but the next morning, knock at the door. He opens the door, and 50 people are standing there asking him for prayer. 50, 50 Drews, and he starts praying, Lord, heal this person, do this. He is the most humble, unassuming man you would ever meet. He has a little spiral notebook, the last time I checked it, 90 miracles. Uh, People that had heart attacks, people that had cancer, I mean, big stuff, right? Not post-nasal drip, big stuff, right? (laughs) Verified, these are legitimate miracles. What's happened since then? Well, we don't call them an unengaged people group anymore. There are over 2,000 believers now of the Druze in Syria, and they have sent missionaries to Saudi Arabia and Brazil. I think they got it, and they're growing, and that's what God's trying to do. Uh, So you may meet Muslims here in America. By the way, did you know that a million people from the Middle East moved to America last year? And, uh, you know, I grew up, I was an FBI son. My dad was an FBI. I grew up in Chicago and Las Vegas because the mafia was there. So, like, my third grade class at St. Anne's Catholic School, I was the only boy that didn't have an Italian last name. (laughs) So I'm Doyle, but all my classmates are Genovese. It's an interesting family. Costello, Parisi, Serino, Tagano, Romeo. I mean, all... Italians, many of them connected with the mob, and um, 
something happened really bad as the FBI was busting the mafia in the 60s in Las Vegas. They got a chilling phone call one day from a guy that was a mob crime boss, and he said to the head of the FBI office in Vegas, tell the FBI boys to watch their kiddos. I mean, we wouldn't want anything to happen to them, you know? Click. Well, a few days later, my sister and I are walking home, only really a few blocks from home, maybe four or five, and a man drives up in a car, jumps out, black suit, sunglasses, black hat, and starts to chase us. And I was 10 at the time, my sister's 14, we jump over a fence, this guy's coming, and we just kept running and running, finally we outran him, and uh, we were looking for a house, scared to death, we, our parents had warned us, and we... We ran to the first house we could find and knocked on the door and turned the handle and it opened. My, I remember my sister and I just fell in and there was a, a woman ironing and she picked it up to throw it at us. She thought we were breaking in. We said, no, 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 someone's chasing us. And we got in, she locked the door and the chain and she's peeking out the current, yep, there goes the guy in the suit, he's looking for you. So we called my mom. She called dad at the FBI office and dad said, go get him, but drive around. Don't go straight to the house. And so mom came and got us. We were scared to death, crying, you can imagine. Got in the car. Mom drives around, half an hour, 45 minutes. Finally, turns on our block. My dad was going to meet us there. He's way across town. And as we're turning into the driveway, the guy in the car drives by and looks at us in waves. He wanted us to know, I know where you live. And when I think of unengaged people groups, Groups out here that nobody is sharing Jesus with, and there's about 2,000 of them on planet Earth. I think of them like kidnapped children. See, Satan thinks that he can take this group, the Druze. Let's put them over here. Let's keep them away from Christians. One of these days, they're going to die, and they're going to go to hell. But you know what? He has not read Revelation 7, or he just doesn't believe it, because every tribe, tongue, nation, and language will be at the throne. So we know the end. We know how this deal works out. It's going to work. And we just have to go. We just have to. Whether Muslims are here, whether they're around the world, because they are one-fifth of the planet. And researchers say in the next few years, they'll be one-fourth of the planet. So we can complain and say, I don't want them in my country, or we can go and take the love of Jesus to them. And you know what? Hey, listen, I grew up FBI son. Guilty until proven innocent, right? You know, and, I, and I'm pro-Israel. What am I doing going to Muslims? But God broke my heart for them and called us to go. Look at what happened in Thessalonica. Look at verses 9 and 10. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for the Son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Jesus transforms people and people groups. The Thessalonians turned to God. Talk about a cultural shift. They changed, and that's what the Lord is calling us to do, to reach out to them. It is costly. I think we need to ask ourselves, maybe this would be good questions in our newcomers class. Am I willing to suffer for Jesus? Am I willing to die for Jesus? Hey, I'll just speak for my church. That would have thinned the ranks pretty quick, right? Wow. But the Thessalonians turn from idols. And Muslim background believers turn away from false religion and the largest cult in history. You know what we need to do as men of God to encourage our people? We need to pull them to turn away from the twin idols of comfort and safety, where everything is built on comfort. Every time I go to the Middle East, people say, aren't you afraid? And whoa, I say, no, I'm, I'm, Jesus called us there. And then meanwhile, I think, sheesh, New York City had 600 murders last year, you know? So I tell people, I am afraid to go to Israel, you bet. But when I get out of the New York airport, I feel great, actually. So, <laughs> do you believe Jesus is coming back soon? Man, I do. Look at your dashboard. There's only two things to look at. 
There's only two gauges, Israel. And man, Israel has their enemies, just like in the Old Testament, just where they want them. They're surrounded by them. Again, right? They are. And they're going to have to turn to God. And many of them are. But warring nations that want to eradicate them, Syria, Iran. You know, when we're in some of these countries... They can't even, they can't even say the name of Israel. Like if you're watching the weather in Tehran, they'll show Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, and Israel. It's blank. They don't even want to admit that there is a a nation uh, of Israel. And God, we pray that God would turn our president around because I think we're going in the wrong direction, guys. That's the first gauge, Israel. The second, the great commission around the world and here. We need to reach out. So what do I do? What are our takeaways today? Number one, pray aggressively. Pray offensive prayers, not defensive prayers. Don't be buying that on television that we lost, that we're losing in the Middle East, even if believers are martyred. Revelation 12 says they conquered him. By the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony, they did not love life more than death. So even those Egyptian believers that were killed on the beach in Libya by ISIS, that was a victory because Satan threw everything he could at them and they didn't bend. They didn't break. They went to heaven standing firm for Jesus. I I love this. I mean, I've been in Iran where the underground church and they pray This may not be your thing. I hope it doesn't offend you, but this is how they pray in Iran. I said, the Bible tells us to pray for our leaders. Hebrews 13, how do you do that? And they go, it's really simple. When we get together, we pray this. Lord, for the Ayatollah, for Rouhani, all those leaders, number one, Lord, would you save them? Bring them to Jesus. If that doesn't happen, would you just remove them? And if that doesn't happen, would you just go ahead and strike them dead? That's how they pray. I have never been to a prayer meeting like that on a Wednesday night, you know? Wow. So, those 14 unengaged, pray for those. Uh, 838, pray for those believers. Please set your watch and pray for those that are in prison, persecution, and danger. We may not be called to live in persecution, but this is our family. And remember what Paul said, if one of us hurts, we all hurt. And so we need to pray for them, walk with them arm in arm so we can pray. Number two, what can we do in our churches? We can go. The fields are white unto harvest. Man, you guys have great mission programs going. We'd love to join you at E3. We send about 3,000 out every year, Middle East, South America, everywhere. We're in 60 countries. And man, the fields are white. We are seeing more people come to faith in Christ and want discipleship. And by the way, you pastors, Please go with us and teach in the underground church. They love Bible teaching. We brought Ray Bentley out from Maranatha and others. We want you to go with us. You can make an investment there. But what about Muslims coming here? Do I want them to come here? You know, I believe we're living in days like Nehemiah. Remember when Nehemiah, they're building the wall? There's so much hostility around them that here's what he did with those that were building the wall. They put a sword in one hand to protect themselves and a hammer in the other to do the work of God. I think the sword is government. We need our government to protect us, to root out the radicals. If someone gets on a plane from Minneapolis, flies to London, to Turkey, and goes and fights for ISIS in Syria, I'm pretty much thinking that's a one-way ticket. Is that what you're thinking too? I don't want them back. We need our government to work, but the church cannot default over to the government to fix the Muslim problem. It'll never happen. We're called to reach out to them, and they are responding. So I have a friend that's getting his master's down in New Orleans. And when he's down there, he was talking with Vietnamese that were kind of living in the area where he was, and he would say to them, um, oh, okay, you're Vietnamese, you get in a conversation. What religion are you, Buddhist? No, Catholic. Catholic? Really? Yes. And he just asked many of them, no, no, I used to be, but I'm Catholic. Really? Several he's meeting, and they're saying Catholic. So he happened to run into a bishop. Someone introduced him and said, this is a bishop. He goes, I've been wanting to ask you a question. All these Vietnamese 
say they're Catholic. How in the world did that happen? You know what the bishop said? He says, really simple, Jim. We're the ones to meet him at the ships when they get to the dock. What about the airplanes that are coming in with Muslims? This is risky, right? But there's a church in Spokane that just found out 900 Syrians are moving to their city. It would be typical to do the American Christian thing. I don't want them here, right? But what better thing could we do than to reach them with the gospel? Hey, I am pro-Israel, son of an FBI agent. Not exactly a candidate to reach Muslims, right? But let's reach them with the gospel. You know what this church is doing in Spokane? They're gonna, they got the flights when the refugees are coming in. Almost all of them are Muslims. They're going to be at the airport with signs saying, welcome to our city. We love you. We follow Jesus. They'll be in Arabic. They're going to meet him at the plains and become friends with them and try to love them to Jesus Christ. That's being proactive. So number one, pray aggressively. Two, go. And you can go in your city. Three, look up. Jesus is coming back. The days are numbered. We should look for that. We should be ready. Four, be a family. We're in the West. The believers in the East have a difficult time. Pray for them. Walk with them. Encourage them. Follow their example. There's a lot we can learn sitting at the believer's feet. I mean, the attitude in the Middle East is they're killing Christians. But those, there are those that are living the life where it's not safe to believe and flourishing for Christ, and they're willing to die for Jesus. So if you watch the news, you have to ask yourself the question, is Christianity winning or losing? Are you kidding me? This is one of our finest hours. And so we have some friends that live in Dallas, Jay and Marsha, typical Americans, and some Muslims moved in on their block, and praise God, they didn't call the police or 911, you know, they, they, they met them and realized, gee, they're pretty nice people, actually, and so they, they said, could we have you over for dinner? They said, well, that would be great, so they had a really nice dinner and did hummus and all the Middle East stuff, and families there, and they have two kids, and let me tell you, the kids were bouncing off the walls. They have these two kids, and the Kuwaiti little kids are bouncing off the walls, Jane Marsha said it was like they drink Red Bulls in the car or something. You know, they're just out of control. And the mom looks at, at them and says, I'm so sorry that the kids are wound up. And they said, no, that's okay. And she said, but you, you got to see, we've lived in America almost eight years now. And, and this is the first time we've ever been invited into an American home. Does that just sound a knife through your chest like it does me? And the reason it does is because I would have been there years ago. I wouldn't have wanted them in my house. But Jesus broke my heart for them. I started to see them come to faith in Christ. I started to learn from them with their passion for Jesus. So guys, open your eyes. The Muslims are ready. Let's go get them. I close with this. So we moved from Colorado to Dallas, Texas. Man, it is just stinking hot in the summer. It's like 190 out there. It's terrible. And so Colorado, you know, we used to see all the Texas license plates in July and August. So I'm at our ministry, E3, and finishing up the day. And I just had one of those days. You ever have one of those days where everything you do, you're late? Like, I just was late every appointment. And I'm not in the spirit either. I'm angry. And so I get in the car. It's 530. I realize I have to pick up Joanne. She's like way over on this side of town. Then we got to go over here. That, we're going to be so late. Are you kidding me? I get in the car and it says six miles till empty. Great. Okay, so I get off the freeway. There's three stations. I'll go to that one. I go stick my card in and it says, must see cashier. So I admit, I stopped and said, come on, Lord, can I get a break, please, today? Not in the spirit. So I walk in, plunk down my card. This woman comes up. She's from the Middle East. And I said, whoa, you, you're from the Middle East. I go to the Middle East all the time. I, I, I love it. I love your people. And she's Muslim. And, and she goes, really? And I said, yeah, where, where are you from? And she said, well, if you go to the Middle East all the time, you have to guess. So I said, okay, uh, Egypt. She said, nope, Saudi Arabia. So really awesome. I've, wow, love to go there. 
take the gospel there. Love to go there. And so um, I'm leaving and I said, well, you know what? I, I wrote a book about your people because do you know that God is honoring your people? God, God is honoring your people. She said, what do you mean? He's coming to them and uh, in dreams and visions. She said, really? You wrote a book about dreams and visions? I said, yeah. And she goes, I've been having dreams about Jesus. I said, excuse me a second. <laughs> Forgive me, God, for that crack about my schedule and my time. And I give her the book, and I'm leaving, and she's already flipping through, and she's saying, this is my life. This is me. So I take off. By the way, I made it to our dinner on time. Always worried about our schedule interruptions. Two days later, out of gas, going back to the ministry, and I thought, hey, I'll stop by there. So I drove up. Ooh, I'll go to the same pump. Stuck my card in. Worked perfectly. <laughs> See, I don't think it was a card malfunction. I think it was an order from God. And it didn't say, please see cashier. Must see cashier, right? <laughs> so I go in, and there she is. She's got the book, and she said, this is my life, Tom. I can't believe you gave me this book. And I said, so when did you start having Jesus dreams? She said, 40 years ago. I said, you've been having dreams about Jesus for 40 years? Yes. I said, well, like, you remember them? They're like high definition. Yes. What was the first one? I was walking with Jesus. He put a ring on my finger. It was something like when we follow him, it's, it's like a marriage or something. Is there anything in the Bible like that? And I said, I can't think of anything. No, no. And so... I said, are you kidding? 40 years of dreams, and didn't you talk to a Christian, and didn't you go to a church? She goes, plenty of them. But I guess because I'm Muslim, I, I think they were afraid of me or something, and I never really got answers. But here's what I knew, that Jesus loved me so much. He used to tell me this in every dream, Tom, that I knew one day he was coming for me. I said, Rawia, today is that day. And at the FINA gas station on Coit and the Bush Freeway in Dallas, Rowia prayed to receive Jesus, who she'd been looking for 40 years. <laughs> and let me tell you, she loves him. Why do I say that story? To show you, because I was being an idiot. I wasn't in the spirit. I wasn't even looking for that. Open our eyes, guys. Reach out to them. If we don't reach out to Muslims, they're going to retreat and become more Islamic. Reach out to them. Show them Jesus' love. Be at the airports. Be at the, at the docks. Tell your churches to go. Do a seminar, how to love Muslims to Christ. It's simple. They are sending up SOS signals. They don't like ISIS either, most of them, and they are open to Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you that we live in this amazing generation that you're moving it's unexpected in our minds because we thought somehow that they were unreachable. But Lord, there was a Saul who became a Paul, and boy, we would say he was a terrorist. He was involved in all kinds of terrible things. But Lord, thank you that you have brought these people to America. Open our hearts. They're not off the table with the gospel. Everyone needs Jesus, and no one is unreachable even Muslims. Send us as your church. May we lead the way as men of God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for letting me be with you.